Welcome back. This is the third video in our series about atoms. Make sure you have watched atom behavior structure and atom behavior covalent bonds before you start this video. And as always, have some paper and pens to draw. So we have already learned that the reason atoms make bonds is because they aren't really happy alone. And that when they share electrons, they get to borrow another atom's electron to kind of puff up the number of electrons that they can count towards the octet rule. And we've also learned that there are two different types of covalent bonds. Polar bonds is when they are shared unequally, and nonpolar bonds are when electrons are shared equally. And the last thing we learned, that when there is a difference in electronegativity in a polar bond, that causes partial charges on the atoms and can cause transient attractions between the molecules. Now remember that covalent bonds are very strong bonds. They usually need an enzyme to either form them or break them. So they're not just sort of dissociating and walking away from each other. They're kind of like a marriage. You are legally bound together in marriage. It takes a lot of money to get yourself apart. Same thing with covalent bonds. But sometimes this all might seem like too much commitment for an atom. In some cases, they don't really want to fully share electrons. It's just easier to temporarily hook up. So how do we know which one they're going to do? Temporary hookup or getting married for the long haul? Well, of course, it starts with their structure. Let's draw lithium, atomic number three. Go ahead and draw that out, put this on pause, and come back. So now that you're back, you should know that the atomic number three means that you have three protons, which means that you have three electrons. And when we draw it out, it looks something like this. And it does not fulfill the octet rule in any way. There's only one electron in the valence shell, that outer purple shell. And for this particular atom to be fulfilled, it would have to make a huge number of bonds, which is really unlikely. It's going to have to bond and be able to share seven more electrons. That's just unlikely to happen. For this guy, it's much easier to just let it go. No, seriously. This atom will let go of that pesky electron, leaving only the two that are on the inner shell. When this happens, it does fulfill the octet rule. Because remember, the valence shell is now that green shell. It's the one that has the outermost electrons in it. And it has two in the outermost shell, and it fulfills the octet rule. However, the number of electrons on this atom has changed. We have three protons and only two electrons. So P no longer equals E. And this means that this is now a charged atom. It has more protons, more positive charges, than it does negative charges. So we call any atom that has a charge an ion. And in particular, for lithium, we now write it as lithium ion. It is positively charged because it has more positives than negatives. But what happens to this discarded electron? It has to go someplace, right? Well, it does. That electron can actually join another atom that needs it. For example, chlorine. Chlorine has atomic number 17. I'm not going to have you draw this whole thing out. You could just watch me do it. There it is. We have 17 protons in the nucleus, and we took our 17 electrons and we spread them through the shells as we had learned to do two on the inner shell, eight in the second shell, and only seven in the third shell. And that makes up 17 electrons. This guy does not fulfill the octet rule. We need that other electron from lithium. It's floating around out there, and if it joins chloride, it has received an extra electron, and now it fulfills the octet rule. It has eight electrons in the outer shell. But the other thing that has happened is that it now has more electrons than it does protons. And because it has more electrons, and electrons have a negative charge, it is negatively charged ion. So we write it chloride ion with a little negative on it. 
So lithium and chloride both satisfy the octet role if lithium donates an electron and chloride receives an electron. Now they're both charged, and because they have opposite charges, they're attracted to one another. That attraction is called an ionic bond. In contrast to a covalent bond where electrons are shared, ionic bonds are made when electrons are donated and received, forming ions which are attracted to one another. So we can update our bonds information sheet where we have nonpolar covalent bonds, which are shared equally, polar covalent bonds, which are shared unequally, and now we have something where the positive and negative atoms in the bond are attracted to one another, called an ionic bond. And this is more like a hookup. Covalent bonds are like marriage, ionic bonds are like dating. So why is this important? In an ionic bond, the opposite charged ions are attracted to one another. Here you can see sodium and chloride eyeing each other. Sodium, chloride, sodium ion is positively charged and chloride ion is negatively charged. When they bond together and make an ionic bond, that makes table salt, NaCl. But when you have a polar solvent, for example, water, the partial charges on water interfere with the attraction between sodium and chloride. So instead of bonding to sodium, chloride might end up being attracted to the partial positive charge on the hydrogen atom. This is why salts which are solid dissolve in water, because the structure of the atoms involved influences their behavior. That's it for today. See you in class.